Good day, everyone. Richard Gobberthwaite for Northwest Access TV. Thanks for joining us. And we've got another one of our uh, forums, debates, whatever, with uh, two of the legislative candidates running in Franklin County with Election Day not far away, less than three weeks away. Tuesday, November 6th is Election Day, and early voting has been going on now for some time, and it sounds like a lot of people are doing early voting. Just let me note that we're taping this show on Wednesday, October 17th, in case there are huge issues that surface after we tape the show and you're wondering why we didn't talk about it. Glad to have the two candidates running in the Franklin 3-2 House District. Republican Representative Lynn Dickinson of St. Albans Town, seeing as the district is St. Albans Town, and David McWilliams running as an independent <laughs> for the House in the St. Albans Town District, which covers most of St. Albans Town. Lynn, you're running for your sixth term, is that uh, correct? I am running for my sixth term. And I should I... note, you also, you also grabbed the uh, Democratic nomination on write-ins on primary day. So running with a D and an R by your name. That's right. It's You're running an RD. as a proud Democrat in addition to a proud Republican? <laughs> well, I always like to work with whoever's out there, and I'll work with the Democrats and the progressives, whoever's a Montpelier. Yeah. And David, of course, no stranger to this race. You ran as a Democrat two years ago. Yeah, I've been running since 1991. In That's fact, how long I've first. <laughs> you've, run, you've run before. <laughs> so you, you probably, I, I guess you'd probably acknowledge you're the underdog in this race. <laughs> well, you know, something I, I'm well known, but, you know, some people don't like me because I'm very outspoken. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's my only problem. I didn't take cl a class in diplomacy. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, you seem to have plenty of company if that's the case these days. Did you, did you purposely run as an independent or were you pl originally planning to run as a Democrat again? Well, basically I was so busy with this billing, trying to make sure this billing got finished, I didn't get the, the, uh, the enough write-in. You know, I didn't get the, the petition to get the write-in, so yeah. that's one of the reasons I missed it. And then I had to drive all the way to Mount Fayer just to make sure that my, all my signatures were good. Right. They were checked out by the town clerk and a boardman, and I said, well, i got to get my name on there. I just don't want people to think that I've died and gone away. And now you give, as you said, you're giving voters a choice, competition, and in fact, no <coughs> House members. Every uh, legislative race in Franklin County, uh, there, no, nobody has any free rides this year. Mm -hmm. Give us a little background on yourself, David. Well, uh, first of all, I've lived in uh, St. Albans Town most of my life. I would say probably 50 years I've lived in St. Albans Town. You know, I've worked to the city of St. Albans as an animal control union steward for 38 years. I've worked for the town of St. Albans as their animal control officer. I've been on the select board for two different terms, being on the select board and trying to move the, uh, the town in the direction where the taxpayers don't feel like they're being taxed out of uh, their houses and, you know, can't afford to stay here. And if we don't start doing something right now, then, uh, you know, we're a lot of more people that are retirees that are, you know, retired you know, are going to be forced to leave Vermont you know, or to move into these uh, complexes like up on Fairfax Street where they, you know, uh, they can afford to live and not give up their money for medicine and stuff like that. So that's one of the reasons I run. You know, I'll be like, you know, if I'm running down, uh, if I'm down elected, which probably won't, she'll probably be elected, but, you know, uh, <clears throat> I'll be like a Thank thorn. You. <laughs> I'll be like a thorn down there because, I, you know, I can work with anybody but be honest, and that's what I want. Mm -hmm. Lynn, give us some background, and again, what, uh, was it an easy decision to seek a sixth six term? Yes, it was. Yeah. I've worked with a whole different group of people down there, like I say, different legislative issues that I've worked with. But I've lived in St. Albans for 46 years now. I have um, raised all of my children here, the three children. Uh, luckily, two of them are still here in Vermont. Yeah. Yeah. Um, they work with their father. And um, I've served 10 years down in Montpelier. Long before that, I served uh, in the community and, and was involved in education between being on, ran for the school board, ran for the, on the BFA board, served on that, worked to help make BFA a union high school, served as a, board, a school board member when that happened. I've been involved with the mental health agency in a variety of, of ways. So the, the issues that I've learned in the past 10 years, I served on three committees. I was on commerce and economic development. I was on uh, corrections and institutions, and I was on judiciary. So I've learned a variety of issues in depth serving on those three committees. And uh, there's still a lot of things that I'd like to get done. I have passed some bills. You know, it's a, an accomplishment. Not every bill that's introduced gets passed. And I have passed some what I consider to be pretty important bills. One involved the, uh, make, letting the licensed alcohol and drug counselors who are independent be able to participate in Medicaid so they could um, serve people regardless of their ability to pay. And, um, and the other was the Lyme disease, which acknowledged that the physicians could treat Lyme disease with their patients in an appropriate manner without having to be disciplined. 
Um, and it really resulted in a much larger uh, reporting of Lyme disease. I mean, we all know it's a real, it's an epidemic, really, in Vermont, even here in northern Vermont. And I've worked on a lot of issues, workforce development, economic development, um, education. I uh, worked with, for the community high school in Vermont to keep that intact when I was on corrections and institutions. I've worked on trying to uh, get water through the capital bill for the water quality issues. So there's a whole lot of different issues I've worked on. Speaking of the water quality issue, one of the uh, issues on my agenda here, legislature certainly has received some criticism for still not coming up with a dedicated funding source to address Lake Champlain, Lake Karma, whatever, waterways, uh, water quality woes. And I realize we're in the time of, you know, a lot of candidates, Republicans maybe especially, talking about affordability, maybe talking about it too, people taxed to death. But again, is that a, is that a concern that there's, it yeah. seems like, again, it's the old kicking the can down the road. I mean, it's a huge issue. What about, what about just a year to year funding for, you know, water quality problems remains, seems to remain elusive? Well, there probably isn't any one real big 25, $200 million tax that you can institute. Uh, I did introduce a bill. Uh, the Vermont Conservation and Housing Trust Fund does have quite a bit of money in it. And we have, and I put in a bill to take the conservation money that we've been using to conserve land and to go and use that money instead for the next 20 years to use for water quality. Um, I had a good hearing on the committee now a couple of years ago, and I'm going to bring it up again. Uh, this would generate about $6 million a year, which isn't going to do it all by itself, obviously, but it could be used as a way to be leveraged to help pay off bond money. Um, and what happened in the course of trying to put this bill together, we discovered that the general fund has been siphoning money out of that conservation housing trust fund anyway in the past since 2001. Sometimes it took a little bit, some took it took quite a bit, millions of dollars. So we've already been doing that, and I think that fits the conservation uh, mission. You know, we've been preserving this, conserving this land, and there's something like 25% of our land in the state that has been conserved. So for, we could take some time for 20 years to go and use that to, to conserve our water, to work on our water quality. Um, there's a couple of other smaller things, again, that would raise two to five or six million dollars a year. That can be used to help pay off bonds that are in the capital bill, because that's one area that we can, we have been doing a little bit of that in our capital bill, and that's a 30-year bond. Now, the TDI, which was the, um, the electric um, conduit for bringing power down to Massachusetts, under, they had mm -hmm. under the lake. Under, under, under lake that was originally seen as one of the big sources of this money. It would be, I don't know, 200 and some odd million dollars a year as part of the, the package yeah. over 20 years. And they had also had a Maine option and a New Hampshire option, which were overland. The New Hampshire option was what they chose, and then that was shot down by the, the people Pass, in New Hampshire. I know it, I know yeah. it well. Yeah, that was Yeah, and down. Maine is the other option. It would cost more money initially to put it under the lake, mm -hmm. but in the long run it would be cheaper because you wouldn't have to deal with weather conditions and ice. And it's still not clear whether that's going to That's happen. not been determined. But that was what I think many of us who are involved in the water issue saw as the real yeah. option that we could really use. But barring that, we can do smaller things to help pay off these bonds yeah. if we do that over a period of time. And I think we still look, could look at the, the Housing Conservation Trust Fund, especially since we've been taking the money out of it and using it in the general fund anyway. Okay. David, what do you, would you like to see a dedicated funding source, or is that asking well, too, too much? I, I think we, you know, uh, we need to have a dedicated funding for cleaning up Lake Champlain. MS4 is supposed to help with that, uh, you know, as far as, uh, you know, utility With tax. With runoff and... Yeah, you are city residents and your last yeah. wastewater and water bill is yeah. your utility tax. Yeah. yeah. I hope that money will be used, dedicated for cleaning up Lake Cham Champlain. But we also have to make sure all the camps, all the houses, that are, and all the boaters are not dumping into Lake Champlain. <laughs> if we don't do that, then we're not eliminating the sources of what's uh, of dumping into the lake. Wastewater plant, city of Burlington, you know, how many times? Three or four times they over uh, went into overflow, you know, and they dumped into the city of Burlington, the, the lake. You know, the city of Sonoma has a wastewater plant. They're putting $18 million in it. You know, it probably needs another $10 because when I worked there for 12 years, you know, everything is worn out and everything needs to be replaced. So they are spending $18 million, which will help clean up the lake portion. But also we need to check all the camps, all the houses, 
-hmm. and dye test them and everything that's not hooked on a wastewater system mm -hmm. to make sure that lake starts to clean up. But you also have to remember the people on the other side of the lake, they have to do the same thing over in New York State mm -hmm. and throughout Vermont, all the way down, both sides. You've got to, you know, work together to clean up that lake because once that lake dies, you know, it's never going to come back or it's going to take many years for it to come Does back. Does that issue come up much when you're talking to would-be constituents, uh, is Lake Champlain water quality issues? Is that a big issue or not particularly? Well, you know, it came up quite a bit this year because of the way the lake is down so low. Yeah. You know, really, uh, really you can mow the grass at least 400 feet I can down. almost walk out from Kilcare to Mosquito <clears throat> Island, not quite, and stay dry, but yeah. pretty close. But, you know, if we don't clean up our own backyard and stop mm -hmm. polluting, then we're only destroying our own uh, our own world. Yeah. Lynn, does that issue come up much when you're yeah, in your I discussions? I mean, it's the same. It's this. It's come up really, actually, for now a few years. I mean, we yeah. had that big water quality issue in the legislature a few years ago, and yeah. we put in all kinds of regulations and fees and things to deal to deal with that. And all the communities are all rely, you know, are responsible for this as well. As far as the town roads, the MS4 is going to cost money. I mean, this is the issue: is that we don't have any doubt that this is an important issue. It's a matter of finding a way to come up with the money on a consistent basis without... Sounds familiar. Yeah, I mean, it really is an ongoing issue for many things, but this has really been... It's been an ongoing priority, and, um, and people who, are, who want to have clean water, whether it's Lake Carmi or whether it's, you know, anywhere in the state, you know, half the state flows into the Lake Champlain, the other half flows into the Connecticut River, mm -hmm. and there's issues for them over there in nit for nitrogen. But it's an issue for the towns, it's an issue for individuals, it's in, in issues for our, our combined sewer overflow, you know, the, uh, the things that would happen with our, our, our wastewater overflow with the stormwater. Stormwater is a real big issue. Mm -hmm. So yes, it's a continuing issue. Uh, David, Gov Governor Scott, uh, a huge issue before the legislature, gun control measures, uh, Governor having a change of heart there, but in your view, did the governor go too far with gun control measures or not far enough? Well, you know, we, how long have we had guns in, in the <laughs> United States? Many, many, many years. It's the responsible people that uh, you don't have to worry about. It's the irresponsible people, people with mental health issues, people that, you know, don't teach your kids about taking gun or safety course. You know, if we start educating our kids as they grow up and getting the uh, guns and rifles out of the people that are mental health people, Maybe we can, you know, stop all the shooting in the city of Detroit. Was there a one weekend? There was eleven shootings up there in the city of in Detroit. Chicago. Boy, you read yeah. about Chicago. It seems like every every weekend. Yeah, Boston is getting just as bad down there. You know, uh, you know, look at that shooting we had on Upper Welland Street. That was all drug related on Diamond Street. You know, uh, and mm -hmm. if we don't stop that, you know, we'll get the drugs out of here. You know, that drug unit that the St. Albans Town gave 110000 and the city gave 110000 Street crime unit. Street crime yep, that is, that's doing its job here in this area, you know. But, you know, what the problem is, is you drive those other big druggy uh, guys out and they go somewhere else. But, you know, we're, the, the drug unit for the city of St. Albans is doing an outstanding job. So, again, the stat, you would have been happy just keeping the status quo and not enacting any of the measures that's of the right. legislature. Yeah. Lynn, what about, what about yourself? Well, did I sat you, in did you judiciary. Any, did you support any of the I governors? I did. I did. Yeah. I didn't support all of it. You know, I agree that I, I've got an A minus from the NRA, right. and they're yeah, yeah. in the latest letter they sent to me. And yeah. I have supported supporting act, uh, the Second Amendment. I mean, we do have responsible people in Vermont. You know, Vermont has got a tradition of hunting, and we use it for food, and we use it, um, you know, as a way to manage our wildlife. So it's got a real value to our communities. And, and most people are very responsible about it. Uh, there were really three bills. One was S-221, which was the red flag, high risk, extreme risk bill. That is a bill that was, would have people who could notify the police that they had someone who was a, either harmed to themselves or to others. Um, you know, there's any variety of circumstances that can go into that. It also protects due process by allowing uh, within 14 days, there has to be a court hearing, and then within six months, you can have another court hearing on for as many times as you need to. But that's the kind of thing that keeps these um, individuals who are in these targeted shootings, you know, like the Sawyer case. Uh, that's what they actually use to finally take the gun away from him in the actual, um, for the state. But it also, where it's been enacted in the past, what, the thing that it, it really has helped is to prevent suicides. And, you know, the targeted shootings get all the publicity, but the suicides are the real numbers and the real problems in terms of people taking their lives. 
So that's the, that was a bill I voted for. All of the people involved, whether it was Gun Sense, Gun Owners of America, uh, the sportsmen's clubs, the police, the lawyers, you know, the state's attorneys, they all worked to, on that bill and everybody agreed that was the single most important thing that we could do. Mm -hmm. The other thing we dealt with was H-422, <clears throat> which dealt with um, the domestic abuse, taking uh, weapons away from people with, in domestic abuse situations or domestic violence. Um, and that was done, again, with a way to have what they call a flash sighting so that it would preserve the due process rights. They would have fast track for arraignment so the judge could see them first thing in the morning when they, the next day, they would have the state's attorney who, would, who could be notified by the police on call all hours of the day and night who could then notify a judge. It was a, it was a way to solve the problem because the problem of domestic violence is a very real one. It's the most volatile situation for police. And you never know what's going to happen and how it's, who's going to be hurt with a thing like this. And it puts the victim at the most risk when the police are called in. So that's a way to go and deal with that issue and still preserve due process. And again, there's a way to go and return the drugs, return the, the guns, if there's ever any reason why they think it can be, unless it's evidence. You think this, you think this issue will get more attention? Is this, is this, is it's this, a serious issue, I mean, for yeah. everywhere, but in you the think police. think it will resurface in the next session of the legislature? I don't think, know, I don't yeah. know, because the third bill was the one that, um, that had the, uh, the magazines and the bump stocks, bump stocks. And, and we could vote on individual pieces of that. I voted on, no on the, on the bill as an entirety, but I voted yes on some parts of it. And that really, some of it was very perfectly good things to have. I mean, how to get rid of the guns that are in storage that the police have already held. They have, they're just, some things they're just totally overwhelmed by the amount of stuff that they have to keep and hold on to. So there was a way to get rid of that in a very logical, uh, good way. The bump stocks, obviously, I voted against. But there were some parts of it that are unenforceable. Some of it is in the courts is, um, is unconstitutional. So we'll see how that works. You're, you're supporting Governor Scott's re-election bid. I can only I assume. do support Governor Scott. See, do you think he was, um, did, that, did that hurt him? You know, it might have. I mean, we heard a lot of this stuff in our committee. And, and in the end, I think he did what he thought he had to do that was right. Yeah. I mean, this was really a vote of conscience and a vote of, in a, in a way to really prevent violence and harm to our schools. Um, there was a study done, uh, released in about 2000. It was with the, um, the, um, the uh, Secret Service, which is the thing where ATF reports to, and the Department of Education. And they examined all the school shootings from 1974 to 2000. Uh, this was right after Columbine. And they found like 87% of the time, these, these shooters had notified people that they were going to do this. This was not a secret. And I listened to something on, um, on public radio talking about it. You know, he came in and this, this kid wrote these things down, was very upfront about what he was trying to do. They want to tell people what they're going to do. And, um, and a lot of times these school shootings, it's well known. It's, it's not out of the blue. Yeah, tough, tough, tough issue. David, Gov Governor, are you supporting one of the candidates for governor? Oh, well, just the opposite. I'm uh, supporting you know, Christine, so the Democrat, I'm Christine Hawkins. Christine. <laughs> you know, uh, <clears throat> Phil's done a halfway decent job, but I think on certain areas, guns and uh, marijuana thing, you know, uh, I'm putting my money behind Christine. And you mentioned marijuana. Of course, legislature voted to legalize recreational marijuana. Your thoughts on that? Not a, not a good move? I think uh, legalizing marijuana so everybody can start growing plants, two plants in their cellar, plus uh, two full grown, plus two small ones, is going to cost us more problems, just like alcohol has caused problems. Even in my family, my father was an alcoholic, mm -hmm. my brother was an alcoholic. You know, my, both of my father and my brother got caught for DWI, and, you know, and I, I think that uh, given the, uh, the marijuana thing issue, it's going to have a lot more problem with people driving. That case in Burlington, where those five uh, students were killed mm -hmm. by that guy yeah. that was whacked out on marijuana. So why do we want to have more of that? Lynn, you voted against that? I voted against marijuana. I is that think an this e is easy vote? It's an easy vote. We have this opiate crisis. The last thing we need to do is go and have another gateway drug. Um, we did have, in my committee again, it was in the transportation bill, but our mm -hmm. committee looked at it, was the, um, the saliva test. And that's the kind of real, real time field test that you need. And um, it's not the answer, but at least get you started. It's like what the breathalyzer was maybe, about, maybe 30, 40 years ago. Um, and I voted for that, and that made sense. Um, we have to start with it. 
Um, just like you have the breathalyzer and the data master with the alcohol, this would do the same kind of thing with the saliva test, a two-step saliva test. And um, that at least would give us something. But right now we have no tool. The, the Senate Judiciary Committee, the chairman of the Senate Judiciary Committee just shut that down completely, mm. which is really unfortunate because we need something like that if we're going to have it legalized. And I agree with you. I don't think that growing the plants is any better than anything else. I wouldn't vote for a... a, a you know, a regulated or, or retail market, I think it's just it a bad not, idea. That was my next question. I mean, given the fact legislature voted to legalize recreational marijuana, it doesn't make sense for the state to at least try to get some revenue out of this? The revenue is not going to be sufficient according to the governor's committee, and, um, and I'm not sure that there's really going to be all that much revenue. Colorado hasn't had a great yeah. record with this. Uh, they still have a black market. The medicinal marijuana is not taxed in Colorado, but the regular recreational stuff is taxed. So, of course, everybody really wants to get into the medical marijuana. As the, it's just, it's, it's not good. David, your thoughts on that, too, given the fact that it is, uh, recreational marijuana is a law? Well, Should the state try to I regulate it and generate some bucks out of it? I wouldn't be surprised that this legislator in this coming year, this session, or the following session, we'll vote to, uh, to tax it, you know, and that's mm -hmm. totally stupid, you know. Yeah. Anybody that does that, you know, is asking for more problems with our, our kids that are growing up and driving vehicles mm -hmm. and people being stoned when they're out driving behind the wheel. Mm -hmm. You know, there's enough actions accidentally by people, you know, running into somebody or stuff like that, but when you, with alcohol and, and marijuana, you know, and other drugs, it's, it's just going to increase it. Some other issues that came up uh, last session: paid family leave and fifteen dollar minimum wage, well, which uh, did not did not make it. Your thoughts on yeah, those two well, issues? First, first of all, I, I support the Family Medical Leave Act because of the fact that I'm pro labor. You know, there's sixty eight thousand people in the state of Vermont that are below poverty level. On an average family of four, they're getting only twenty four thousand dollars a year. On a family of three, uh, they're only getting twenty one thousand dollars a year. We need to get the people off on social services because of the fact that we got more people on social services probably than we have people that are actually working in Vermont, not counting our senior citizens. But if we don't increase the, there should be a two-tier wage. Uh, the two-tier wage, why I feel, is kids in high school should be paid the minimum wage. Once they graduate, we need to move them up to $15 an hour. And I know a lot of retail Companies, big store, box stores around here don't like to do that because it's going to cut into their profit margin. But if we don't start paying livable wages around here, then the people can't afford to live here. And if they ain't got the money coming in, they're going to go you know, and go on to drugs and all that, and we're going to be paying through the welfare system. So we actually need a two-tier wage. Lynn, your thought on those two issues? Did you vote, vote against well, both the, of those? <clears throat> well, I voted for an, an increase in the minimum wage a few years ago when Obama and uh, Governor Shumlin were pushing for the $12 minimum wage, and we did vote that in. Um, we already, first of all, we already have our minimum wage index, and it's been indexed for... We're talking about 1150s, Vermont's minimum wage now? Something like, like that, yeah. yeah. It's going up to the 12 the Yeah, it'll up. go up to the $12 at some point very soon. But we've had it indexed for inflation for years and years and years, long before I got there. And so that's why we have one of the highest minimum wages in the country and, to begin and with. That, right? And so, and when the $12 minimum wage is reached in the current statute, then it will go back to the same kind of inflationary index. Mm -hmm. But there's a point of diminishing returns. I mean, I go into um, Hannaford's and Walmart, and they now have those electronic uh, retail um, mm -hmm. scanners. You know, scanners, you know, that you can go and do it yourself yeah. and you know we have ATMs and we have all kinds of things that have gone on to a mm. some kind of a automation mm. and so instead of having 10 cashiers cashing you out they have one or two and I think is I mean even dairy farmers have robots that go and milk the cows and you know organize the you know round up the food and the grain and the hay and stuff so I think that that's the biggest danger to a higher minimum wage. It gets cheaper to buy the machines than it is to pay the minimum wage and the unemployment and the worker comp and the FICA, you know, the Medicaid, Social, uh, Social Security piece and the paid family leave and the sick days and all the rest of it. It just adds up and it gets to be harder for people who really are the entry level people. And, you know, employers tell us they can't find enough people, number one. And number two, when they do hire people, they don't have what they call the soft skills. They don't know how to go and interact with customers. They don't show up on time. They don't call in when their car breaks down or whatever. 
And so they're left kind of without the kind of skills that you really do learn on your first job. Mm. I, Before, work for, yeah. I work for a retailer and they go through 15 to 20 people a month. Oh, I understand that. You know, yeah. and you know, the, the older people are gone back to work. Well, that's what I've done. I've gone back to work, and I work in retail. You know, and I I, uh, I like working with, uh, in the department that I'm in, but I see such a turnover. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. I also see that uh, the way some of management treats some of their employees. You know, if you want to get more out of them, you treat them with respect, mm -hmm. and I don't see that. And I, I told the retailer that I work for, I said, I know all the labor laws, so don't get me pissed <laughs> off. Because I says, you know, I, I will come back. Yeah. So anyways, uh, but, you know, there's irresponsible people out there that don't want to work. Some people, you know, vo uh, work two days and they don't call in the third day. You know, uh, but if you treat your employees right and they're getting a livable wage, then we're going to get them off the welfare system. You know, when the, you know, the people that are on welfare system, they're on there because they ain't making enough. Mm -hmm. Just like a, a single parent with children, you know, we shouldn't take away their, uh, their, some of their income because they made a little extra $20 a, a month uh, extra, you know, for their daycare. Don't take their daycare away. Help them out. We need to get them off the welfare system. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm starting to talk like a Republican. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, there's so many people that are upset because people are just not, you know, getting off their lazy butts and going out there to work. I've worked all my life. Sometimes I work two or three jobs, you know, uh, but we need to get people off the welfare system. Welfare reform seems like the issue always comes up when, does the legislature, and again, you've been down there for a decade, does the le seems like I'm always hearing about that issue, but, um, you know, are there any, I don't know, real significant, serious efforts made to, you know, make it maybe, I mean, you always hear the, often hear the criticism, Vermont's too generous with people, and do you feel that way, and is there any, it's serious a, efforts to deal with that issue or just not enough yeah. uh, support for it? Well, there was um, a bill some years ago uh, with the Reach Up program, which is the welfare system, to, um, I think it goes back to the federal bill when Bill Clinton was in where you had five years and then you had to either get education and training to be able to move on to something with, which is a job or you would only have five years and there were some exceptions. And we, I'm not really sure exactly, it, it created quite a bit of stir in the legislature because there was a bill to, to follow that. I think we originally had it and then it, we had our own welfare reform bill and then that was superseded by the federal bill. And I'm not sure exactly because I'm not really that involved with human services so I haven't really followed it that much but there was a huge effort by the human services to try to deal with that issue, do some welfare reform. Um, created quite a bit of controversy. Now, the other thing is that talks about a lot, and this is something you're talking about, is, is the welfare cliff. You know, all of these benefits that you get when you get to a certain wage, right. you fall off the cliff and you're no longer eligible. And there's always been talk in many, many ways to try to find a way to solve that problem. Because that can be a, an incredibly difficult hardship for somebody who is getting childcare, healthcare, you know, um, all kinds of subsidies, housing subsidies, and suddenly they get, I mean, this woman testified, she had a master's degree in something, and she got to a, a raise, a level, and she lost all her benefits. I mean, they're, it's a, it is a problem that needs to be addressed. I'm getting close to showing. I'm going to take a few extra minutes. I think Zach's monitored. Maybe, hopefully I won't get fired for this, but I just want to keep going a little more. Lynn, sounds like Republicans and Democrats, but especially Republicans, I mentioned affordability. Just sounds like a, the huge kind of mantra, the mantra these days. Um, you know, making Vermont, you know, having Vermonters have a more affordable lifestyle. I mean, is that is that realistic, given some of the issues we've talked about? Can you can you can you make it more affordable to live in Vermont, or is the best we're going to do make it what less? You know, just you know, kind of try to, you know, keep down the decrease and you know, cost of living going up. I mean, I just have trouble picturing the state becoming more affordable. Can you picture that? Well, what you don't want to do is you don't want to make it less affordable. Um, we have a lot of people constantly talking about the carbon tax. It's been out there now four or five years, and they really are working very hard. I think if they get enough Democrats in there to get another supermajority and they can override the governor's veto, if it's, if it's Phil Scott, then they will probably put in a carbon tax, which would add a lot of money to both our gas and our heating fuel and all the other fuels that we need. And you're Vermonters not, you're not can't afford all, that. You're not going to tell me all Democrats are supporting a carbon tax, are you? 
Well, there's quite a few of them that seem to be. But I'm on a lightning detector. <laughs> <laughs> and Republican. But they talk about it all the time, and it is something that is constantly, you know, the issue is still, still it's coming there. forward all the time. But it's also the regulations, you know, in terms of trying to fight affordable housing and try to, to trying to build workforce housing, yeah. which we um, passed a bill for a couple of years ago. It has to do with your taxes going up. It has to do with the child care costs, which we created a regulation, more regulations that went and made it harder for people to afford child care. Mm. And a lot of child care centers just closed down. Yeah. Uh, so it's, it's a regulation tax. How do you, how do you make a, a more perfect world but not drive people into the ground financially? Yeah. Then, David, again, can you picture? Can, can, can you make in the legislature do... You know, well, I think they have to make, for make every effort. Affordable. I think they have to make every effort to make it affordable because people are leaving. You know, I, mm -hmm. I was down to Morris's service center, and he told me there was five people that were coming, came in there, and told him that they were leaving either for North Carolina, South right. Carolina, or Tennessee. Florida. You know, <clears throat> I'm going to be looking at Tennessee uh, next year. Because you assuming, know, assuming you don't get elected to the legislature. If I get elected, I'll be here for two years. <laughs> but I won't run again after that. But I just want to go down there and see what it's like. Maybe but, I'll get so frustrated. But I again, don't. so you're thinking about that. You're just yeah. you know, you're an yeah. example of uh, what we're talking about. Maybe. Yeah, because you know the cost of electricity, the cost of food, cost of fuel. Yeah. You know that carbon tax. Anybody who votes for that should resign automatically when they vote for it because that's going to destroy the rest of the economy in the state of Vermont yeah. because our senior citizens are on fixed incomes. They have enough time just to pay their fuel bill. <laughs> Kerosene right now is $3.38 a gallon. Can you imagine what that would do with $0.88 cent increase? Yeah, gas seems to be hanging right around $3 a gallon, pretty kind of stuck around $3 a gallon. <clears throat> that's because the two oil dealers in the state of Vermont own probably 90% of the gas station. <laughs> Down to a couple minutes. I'll give you each about a minute. Uh, Lynn, make your case for a sixth term. I'll give you about a minute or so. Well, I've worked hard with both progressives and Democrats as well as Republicans. I've worked hard on behalf of the town residents and the, and the town fathers to try to do bills and to try to work with issues that are important to the town. Um, I've served for 10 years, and I will continue to do uh, the kind of work that I've done in the past, listen to people and try to serve the best way I can. I've got lots of experience in education. I, like I say, I've served on three committees with lots of, lots of really different issues that I've gained a lot of knowledge about in the, in the time down there. So I would like to continue that work and uh, the affordability issue and the need of a lot of Vermonters to be able to stay here is really important to me. I have the same experience. So I'd like to continue to do that. David, make your, make your case. Well, the reason I'm running is because I didn't want to run on a post. <laughs> you, know, and, you know, and I've known Lynn since 1991. I ran first against her. You know, I'm looking at trying to work for the working people, trying to get them, you know, so they can afford to stay in Vermont because the high in cost of living in Vermont, if they don't have a livable wage, they're not going to stay here. You know, they'll go to New Hampshire where it's not taxed so much. You know, I look at myself as a person that's going to fight for the working people. You know, I have got some endorsements from uh, the unions and stuff like that. But, you know, some, I don't take donations from any businesses, corporations, or anything like that. I had a guy who wanted to give me a donation from a car deal. I said, keep your money because I don't want to owe you anything mm -hmm. other than do what's right for the taxpayers of the state of Vermont. Sounds like you're not spending your life savings on this uh, no. campaign. Lynn, roughly how much money are you going to spend on your re-election? Uh, so far, I haven't really spent much of anything, quite mm -hmm. frankly. Yeah. I mean, I have all the stuff I've invested in over the past 10 years as far as signs and things. So there's really, yeah. you know, talk to people, I listen to people. It's very good. more important. Hey, on that <laughs> note, uh, thanks for the time. Again, Republican Representative Lynn Dickinson running for re-election, also with a D by her name this time around, and David McWilliams running as an independent this time in the Franklin 3-2 House District covering most of St. Albans Town. Thanks for your time. Good luck. And again, early voting has been underway for a while, so get out there and vote at some point. And thanks to my man, Zach, for doing all the hard work. I'm Richard Coverthwaite. So long for now for Northwest Access TV. Thanks for watching us. See ya. Thank you, Len, for doing it.